Hey guys, I'm back with another part from my life as a joke. One ribbit. The next week, Miss McCoddle points to a cardboard box in the back of the room labeled dolls in giant letters. The head of the committee dropped this off. She said she hopes you'll have a lot of donations for the next for the meeting next month. Not only do I have to go to another meeting with the woman with razor fingernails and stilts, but it seems I'm expected to cart dolls around all day too. I'm definitely recruiting Carly to help me out with this. But it turns out Carly's got her own activities to worry about, and Matt and Umberto want no part of what was supposed to be great, the great plan to be more grown up. Why don't you put the box near your locker, Miss McCoddle suggests, that way people know where to take their donations. I'm usually too busy drawing at my desk to pay attention to the morning announcement, but when I hear my nanus, nanum, oh my goodness, nanimous Swifty snicker over the intercom, I fear for the worst. Dolls, 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 Swifty announces. Bring your new and gently used dolls to Derek Fallen this week. Derek loves to play with dolls and he wants yours. I slink underneath my desk, wishing I could disappear. What makes it worse is that Matt and Umberto are laughing along with the others. Seriously, Swifty continues, Derek is pretending to collect dolls for the new children's shelter, but he really has a giant doll collection at home. Everyone in school can hear Principal Dimitri running towards the mic. So bring all your Barbies, your American girls, your Raggedy Ann's. Derek wants to play with them all. All of them. By the time Mr. Dimitri yanks the mic away from Swifty, the whole school is laughing. This is why most people don't volunteer for things. That and the work. The flyer the committee sent home last week mustn't done the trick because a few kids in my class make the girls take out dolls from their desks and pass them down. Matt takes a stewardess Barbie and dances it across my desk. Coffee, tea, or me? He asks in a shrill voice. I grab the doll out of his hand and shove it under my chair with the others. What a nightmare. Just when I think things can't get any worse, Miss McCoddle tells us to grab out the handouts from our last class. Please don't ask us to read out loud. I think please. But things continue to slide into abyss. Not only is Mrs. McCoddle making us read out loud, but she calls on me first. The story is about a rebellion in a big city, and there are a lot of words I don't know. I realize I'm behind in my vocabulary illustrations and pray Miss McCoddle doesn't stop and ask me to define any of those hard words. I look up at Carly who gives me a reassuring smile to keep going. I know I sound like I'm back in elementary school, but I put one word in front of the other until Miss McCoddle thankfully asks Kevin to pick up where I left off. On our way to science, I gather up my strength and ask Carly if I sounded like a baby. Not everyone reads fast, she says. Besides, it's about how much you understand, not how fast you read. It's a generous bit of feedback, especially since my comprehension is almost as bad as my reading speed. At least I can make up for it in science, which I'm a little bit better at than English. Miss Miller is very excited and tells us that a grant she applied for got approved, so we're starting a new section. She passes around latex gloves with as much gusto as if she's handing out free money. I'm eager to hear what the new project is, but the way my morning's gone so far, I can't say I don't feel a bit uneasy. She actually makes us cl close our eyes. When she tells us to open them, she points to a tray of dead frogs. A few of the kids groan and say, "Ew!" but Umberto, Matt, and I are totally psyched. It's time to dissect frogs. Dissect. <laughs> This is a first. Miss Miller has to tell Matt, Umberto, and me to stop playing with our dead frogs three times before she marches over, wearing her mad teacher face. I have no excuse except for the fact that a lot of kids are freaking out at their dead amphibian, and it seems such a waste not to take advantage of it. Matt excuses himself to go to the restroom. When he comes back a few minutes later, I can see that he wasn't in the boys' room at all but pilfering through the donation box instead. He holds up outfits a few of the dolls were wearing just minutes ago. Before you can say, presto, change-o, 
were dancing our frogs along the table in their new clothes. I especially like the small fedora on Umberto's frog. Boys! Miss Miller is not amused. We disrobe the frogs, but not until Carly digs out her phone and snaps a quick photo. Miss Miller runs through the dissection process step by step, asking us 50 million times if we have any questions. The scalpel is totally cool and I can't wait for her to finish with the instructions so we can begin. When she tells us to pick up a, pick a partner, Matt and Umberto are already sitting together. So I pair up with Carly. You can really smell the formal ladyhide, Carly says. I'm glad Miss Miller opened the windows. She gives my arm a nudge and tells me to stop poking the poor frog. His name is Gerald, I tell her. He's from a large family in the Everglades. Miss Miller finally gives us the go-ahead to start dissecting. As much as I'd like to make the first incision, I decide to be a gentleman and let Carly do it, mostly because she beats me to the scalpel. I didn't think we'd be dissecting till next year, Carly says. This is great. As I watch Carly cut into the frog's abdomen, I suddenly get a whiff of the formaldehyde she's been talking about. I hold onto the corner of the table to catch my breath. Are you okay? Carly asks, barely looking up. I nod yes, but I feel my legs start to tremble. Maybe my problem is that I'm watching someone dissect instead of doing it myself. Hey, how about giving me a turn? Carly hands over the scalpel, and I move in close to Gerald. You seem a little woozy, Carly says. Why don't you sit down? I've got this. Why is Carly treating me like a baby? I shoot her a look of annoyance. But when I turn back to the bench, my hand hits the tray hard, and suddenly Gerald is airborne. I shout, No! As I watch the frog sail across the classroom, almost in slow motion, Matt and Umberto jump off their stools as Gerald glides above their heads. Incoming, Matt yells. In a split second, the class goes from quiet to pandemonium. Miss Miller walks down the aisle, demanding to know what's going on. Just as Maria points to the flying amphibian, Miss Miller finds out for herself when the frog comes in for landing. On her blouse, anyone will tell you Miss Miller is the most non, no-nonsense teacher at the school. So when she starts doing a rabid version of the chicken dance, the entire class breaks into laughter. With all that hopping around, I watch in horror as the frog slides down her neckline and into Mrs. Miller's blouse. Class, stop laughing, Miss Miller shrieks, clawing at her shirt. I look down at the empty tray in front of me. How did this happen? A waft of the formaldehyde hits me, and before I realize what's going on, I drop to the floor. The next thing I remember is crawling into the sitting position. A still not happy Miss Miller waits nearby, asking if I'm okay. I shake my head to rearrange the cobwebs. I've never fainted before. She slowly helps me up. Well, there's a first time for everything. I look around the room. The rest of the kids are all holding in their laughter. As usual, Carly tries to get everything back on track. It was probably the smell. It's pretty repulsive. Maybe Derek passed out from the, all the excitement, Maria says. Or maybe he was too afraid to dissect. Maria gives me a smirk. That's what I get for trying to scare her earlier with my dressed up frog. Derek sits down for a few minutes. Miss Miller is firm, furiously rubbing her neck with a paper towel. Everybody else, back to work. Before he returns to his bench, Matt pulls me aside. It was awesome. When you fainted, Miss Miller bent down to see if you're okay. And the frog fell out of her shirt onto you. You're wearing it like a brooch, Umberto adds. That didn't happen. But when I looked around the room at my classmates, their giggling tells me Matt and Umberto are telling the truth. Now, I'm the one grabbing for the paper towels. I spent the rest of class hiding behind Carly and poor Gerald. She's about to give me a turn with the scalpel. But Miss Miller tells me to sit this one out and take notes instead. I get the feeling she's going to make me miserable for the rest of the school year. Why did I think this was the year I'd become one of the guys the older kids looked up to? 
Not the boy who fainted at a frog while everyone else takes part in a grown-up science class. I hurry out of class as soon as it ends, but Swifty and Joe are already at my locker. Joe picks up a few dolls out of the collection box and holds them up in front of me. Oh no, it's a frog! I'm gonna faint! One by one, Joe sails the dolls into the air while Swifty fakes a girl's scream and jumps up and down like Miss Miller. All I want to do is go home. But before I do, I have to drag several boxes of dolls out of my dad's car. Worst day ever. Surprise guests. At home, my mom is talking to a woman who looks familiar, but I can't remember how I know her. The woman follows around a toddler who's exploring every inch of our kitchen. When I see Mrs. Mitchell come out of the bathroom, I realize the woman is her daughter who I met at Mr. Mitchell's funeral a few months ago. The toddler must be Mrs. Mitchell's granddaughter. Mrs. Mitchell gives me a hug and thanks me for taking in her trash barrels every Thursday. I tell her it's no problem because it isn't. She scoops up the toddler just as the girl's about to stick her finger into the electrical socket near the door. I take satisfaction in the fact that I'm not the most childish person in the room for a change. My mom peels a green apple as she talks. I was just telling Mandy that we'd be happy to watch Olivia while she helps Mrs. Mitchell pack. I still can't believe you're moving, I tell Mrs. Mitchell for the 20th time this month. The house is too big for one person, she says, and it makes more sense for me to move Calabal Calabasas to be closer to Mandy and Olivia. The only thing I know about Calabasas is that it's a big horse town. Mrs. Mitchell seems a bit old to take up riding, but I guess there's a first time for everything. I'm in the middle of visualizing Mrs. Mitchell on a stallion, lassoing cattle, but am cut by, short by Olivia grabbing my cheeks. I quietly remove her hands and tell her I'm not made of Play-Doh. Mrs. Mitchell flips through a stack of photo albums she must have brought with her. Derek, come look at this. I tear myself away from Olivia's grabby hands and look at the photo. Mrs. Mitchell is pointing to, is that me, I ask? My mom looks over Mrs. Mitchell's shoulder and laughs. I remember that day. You were covered in mud from head to toe and didn't want to change. You had to chase him up and down the street, Mrs. Mitchell adds. Look at this one, too. She points at yet another photo of me as a toddler. If I'd known this afternoon was going to be a trip down Derek as a baby lane, I would have stayed in school and fainted again. Mrs. Mitchell points to a photo of her and Mr. Mitchell standing under an awning at the pinkest tree I've ever seen. There's nothing like the jacaranda trees in springtime, Mandy says. This was taken on a flower street. Mrs. Mitchell looked wistfully at the photograph. I'm sure she's thinking about Mr. Mitchell more than the tree. My mother gives Mrs. Mitchell a gentle smile. Flower street? How appropriate. It's poetic too, Mrs. Mitchell continues. This was taken where Flower Street turns into hope. Mandy gives her mom a smile. That looks a little sad, then tells Olivia they have to go. Olivia likes you, my mom tells me later. You'll make a great babysitter. I was about to complain that my mom said we were going to watch Olivia, not me alone. When I suddenly realized that neither Bodie nor Frank is in the kitchen. Mom says she wasn't sure Olivia would interact with animals. So she put them in her office before they came over. I go next door to retrieve them and get us all a snack. There have been a lot of changes in our neighborhood lately. In the past two months, four different people on the block have moved. I can understand Mrs. Mitchell wanting to be closer to her daughter and granddaughter, but I also can't imagine anyone living in that beige Sakudo house but her. As I get Frank and Bodie, I decide not to tell my mom about fainting in science class today. She'll just ask 50 million questions and want to observe me all night when the only thing wounded is my pride. Besides, I've got a monkey and a dog. If they can't make you feel better, nothing can. As I peel a banana for Frank, I realize he's making less noise than usual and wonder if he's already gotten into trouble. But he's lying on the rug, rug next to Bodie, a real Christmas card pitcher sucking on a pacifier. Between the diapers and the pacifier and the way he's cuddled next to Bodie, Frank could almost pass for a human baby. Okay, a hairy human baby. He fights me a little but finally surrenders the pacifier 
for a piece of banana. I know how possessive babies are, <coughs> excuse me, with their things. So I walk over to Mrs. Mitchell's to bring the pacifier back. When Olivia sees it, her eyes light up like a Santa Claus is the new paper boy. We've all been... We've been looking everywhere for that, Mandy says. Thanks so much for returning it. I dangle the pacifier in front of Olivia, who tries desperately to grab it. Frank was using it. I tell Olivia's mom, I think he likes pacifier as much as Olivia does. She asks me who Frank is. Our cat punch and monkey. No one in the history of kids has ever cried louder than Olivia when her mother yanked the pacifier away, just as she was about to pop it into her mouth. I rinsed it, I say, with soap. Olivia is now in a full-blown temper tantrum complete with screaming, kicking, and tears. Thanks for bringing this back, her mom says, shoving the pacifier back in her pacifier into her pocket. She hastily closes the front door, but even ten doors can't stop the sound of all that crying. That is the end of that part. I hope you enjoyed, and I'll see you very soon with the next part.